All right, look, we talk about this every single damn week because in the seven days between one rampage and another rampage, I get people messaging me going saying, Sam, I don't think rampage is a must-see show. Okay, I figured it out for you. If you don't think it's a must-see show, just don't watch it. And of course, it could be better. Everything could be better. But if you take it in context, it has some good bits and it has some bad bits, which works for me because my name is Simon Miller. Welcome to What Culture Wrestling. And I give the good bits an up and the bad bits a down when it does come to pro wrestling. So this works for me. Let's do it. This week off with the House of Black taking on the Dark Order to see who was going to progress in the trios tournament. And the strange thing with this is that all week long it's been all like, oh my gosh, who's going to be the mystery man? Who's going to be the third dude teaming up with the Dark Order? And then it was 10. That's like me telling you there's going to be a surprise at my wedding and in walks my mum. Still, this match did have stakes to it, which is why the best friends as well as Dan Housen was watching on. And I know I got it wrong on Dynamite. I said they were taking on the winner of the other trios match. They're actually taking on the winner of this match. Look, I'm just a human being. I have to watch like 24, 7 million hours of wrestling a week. Sometimes I make a mistake. I'm also not very good at my job, but otherwise I thought this stuff was pretty solid, especially because Ten and Brody King did start out. And in the early going, it certainly appeared that Ten suffered an injury. And the House of Black were all over this. They were like, Haha, we're going to rip his leg off. And oh my gosh, what will happen if the Dark Order wins? but Ten isn't able to compete with McNudge Nudge. This also led to John Silver being tagged in there and everybody went crazy. And what I loved about this is Malachi Black and Buddy Matthews were all like, hey, hey, now we're gonna take you out, but they couldn't. To the point, everybody got involved. The tag clacks and ha, sounded that went off and we had a massive fisticuff. This triggered the commercial break and somehow that damn advert always benefits the heels because when we did come back from picture and picture, the House of Black were in charge. So listen, if you are a good guy team or a good guy wrestler, listen out for when you know the commercial is coming and then just leg it because you ain't gonna win. It was Alex Reynolds that got absolutely smashed here before he did tag in 10, who was allowed to run wild for a little bit. Because not only did he hit Matthews with the blue thunderbomb, but he took out Malachi Black with a spine buster, and it looked like he was rollicking and rolling. Instead though, Buddy was able to get back to his feet and hit this meteoria off the top, which was pretty cool. And this is when Silver and Reynolds were like, oh man, we're gonna beat up Brody King. And I was like, you two schmoes, what are you doing? Have you seen this man? He is huge. As a prize, surprise, he beat him up. I mean, they are like trying to climb a building when you don't have any arms. And once again, Ten and Black were going at it. But Ten couldn't get any momentum because his damn knee was in trouble. And this is when the last thing I was expecting happened. Because Malachi was all like, I'm gonna kick you in the head and I'm going to win. When Miro's music played, meaning he must have been by the audio guy going, wait a minute, wait a minute, do it now, do it now. It surprised Black so much that he had no idea Alex Reynolds was back in there. He snuck up and hit the most devastating move in all oh, sports entertainment, the surprise roll up. And it truly was a surprise because it worked and the Dark Order won. The House of Black jumped the Redeemer after this because he had been stupid and come out into a three-on-one situation, but it just meant two people had to make the save. It was Sting, it was Darby Allen. We can do this trios match at the pay-per-view. For some reason, All Out is gonna have about 900 trios matches, but do I wanna see this? And am I so thankful to see Miro in a match again? You bet your ass. And look, yes, I know music distraction isn't very AEW and it's more sports entertainment, but they never do this and you are allowed to utilize it. Just don't go crazy with it. Also, don't forget about that plant seating. No, seeding plants, whatever the hell I'm talking about. I just told you it doesn't seem like 10 is going to be able to compete in the next match or in the finals. So maybe, just maybe, it has to be Hangman. Adam Page. Also, just to make it very clear, Miro could kill my hamster and I'd still love him. That was a little bit much. Quick chat with Hook after this, who was asked, what do you think about 2.0 coming after your FTW title? He went, well, I got great hair, I don't care. This is when Matt Menard and Angelo Parker did walk in though, and seriously, these two are like my favorite wrestlers in the entire business that don't get talked about enough. I mean, you could give them a microphone and tell them to say anything, and they could go, hello, my name is Brian, and the way they deliver it was just 
crack me up. To the point, I didn't say this, don't tell anyone, I want one of them to be Hook. I think then somebody remembered, oh wait a minute, Wardlow's our TNT champion and probably needs a big win. So we got it. Because he would take it on Ryan Nemeth and yes, the TNT title was on the line. And bless Ryan Nemeth, man. He came out and cut generic hill promo one-on-one. -on -one. And I also think he forgot the name of the Cleveland football team. But this worked for me. He came across like such a prick. It's also when Wardlow just barged his way to the ring. I think it went clothesline, clothesline, clothesline. Powerbomb, 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 powerbomb. Ryan Nemeth was dead, one, two, three. The interesting part is that Jay Lethal and his buddies, as well as Chris Saban, were watching this on from the entrance ramp. And as somebody who has been watching TNA slash Impact for a long time, that was kind of crazy, because I tell you this, Chris Saban doesn't get his due. Nothing happened after, which was a bit weird, and do note that Wardlow won this when he just put his foot on Ryan Nemeth's chest, so we are still pushing him. I still think he needs to be involved in the singles feud soon. This was fine. And then he got super confused because we were in the back with Andrade, Roosh and Private Party and Andrade was all like, oh, you absolute fools. You lost to Swerve in our glory recently and that makes us look bad. I was like, didn't you break up already? I have no idea. His big threat though is that there is going to be consequences. So I suppose they're about to break up. I think we need a little bit more structured storytelling here. We shall see. And then we did another squash. This time it was to try and turn powerhouse Will Hobbs into a super duper mega heel. And my gosh, did we do that. Because he was taken on Ashton Day, which made me laugh. Because I know somebody called Ashley Day and this was not the same person. But honestly, it was like exactly the same as the Wardlow match. It went clothesline, 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 punch you for a bit. And then the most horrific spine buster you've ever seen in your life. This poor fool landed right on his head. He absolutely killed this guy. And then we cut to the back where we saw the factory beating up Ricky Starks. And I did kind of like this because QT Martial had promised he was going to do this. And it's not really because they like Will Hobbs because they're terrified of him. I really do like how this is making Will and Ricky even bigger stars than they were though, meaning when they do have their pay-per-view match, both should benefit. So I am gonna give it an up. However, it was absolutely bizarre. We literally, it was like the scripts got mixed because we had one squash match and then the exact same squash match and it's the law of diminishing returns. It is just true. You see one thing and then you see the same thing again. It's like if you have a cheesecake and it's all oh, the best cheesecake ever, but then you have that same cheesecake, the second one is still gonna be good and you're still gonna enjoy it, but it's not going to massage your palate in the same way. Never going to review feud. And I get it, Rampage is a short show, but you don't want to overpack it. And this did feel like a little bit of overpackaging. It's getting it down. We had another interview go bad after this, and you have to presume that Stokely Hathaway has been taken away from the baddies, because it was Jay Cargill and her crew. Stokes was nowhere to be seen, and Cargill just lost a man and said, Layla Gray, I don't like you anymore. Get the flub out. She also told Athena that she wants to beat her up at the pay-per-view when Athena did run in to get some shots in. I just have to say this. Athena has been on AEW television for a long ass time. I don't think she's ever had a singles match and we should have done this brawl a long time ago. However, better late than never, we are gonna do it all out. And given their different styles, I actually think this could be one. Ow to keep an eye on. They had more randomness just because I think I need a little bit more story. But the AAA Mitch Tag Team Champions, Sammy Guevara and Ty Mello, were taking on Ortiz and Ruby Soha. Now, given thanks to Eddie Kingston, we do understand the connection here, but it's still a little bit like, well, where did that come from? This was all right though, and at one point Ortiz was just punching Sammy. And I was like, I bet Eddie Kingston is enjoying this. And that's the last time I'll make that joke, because we don't need to get into it. In fact, we should draw a line under it. And there was a lot of times when Mello was going after Ortiz, and even though he would like throw her around, he wouldn't lay a hand on her. That's what we do in mixed tags. However, when Sammy tried to do the same thing when everybody was tussling on the top, Ruby Soho did give him a hurricane rana. At the same time, Ty Mello then hit a cross body, and I do have to say that was very well put together. Ruby was then back with a no future, but Guevara broke that up, so this was all over the place. And yes, once again, Ortiz found him and was just giving him the shots, and I've already said I'm not gonna make that joke again. This was utter carnage though, because all of a sudden Anna JAS ran down, she grabbed Ruby, she threw her into the still steps. Everybody was confused by this, including Ortiz. 
when Sammy Guevara came off with the cutter off the ropes and he pinned him for the one, two, three. And honestly, if you go watch this match, it is far more nuts than I've made it out to be. At one point, Ortiz was just bleeding and I have no idea why, so maybe something happened in the edit. Like, it was like that game he used to play where you write one line of a story and you fold it over, you give it to the next person, they write the second line of the story and at the end you reveal it and you just have up to gibberish. That's kind of what this was. So it was absolute madness. But I asked myself this question, was it boring? No, it was not. I was actually quite sports entertained, even though these Triple H Mac mixed tag team titles. It's just so, where do they come from? Where do they go? Where did you come from? Cotton Eye Joe, still giving it up. We then got this CM Punk segment that had been teased all week long. And while it was kind of interesting and intriguing, you do have to throw your hands in the air and admit it only went for about 37 seconds. And it was basically Punk after the Dynamite match talking to the trainer saying, oh my gosh, my foot really went, I felt it. And that's doubly as concerning because when I broke it first time, I didn't feel a thing. Now, if you do like to delve into wrestling rumors and everything like that, it does seem like Mox versus Punk is the main event at All Out. And how this ties in, I don't know. Maybe you feel like we should have done something more here or something a little bit more obvious that we are heading in that direction. Once again, we must wait and see. Which did indeed bring us to our main event, which was Claudio Castagnoli defending his Ring of Honor title against Dustin Rhodes. And while all the ROH stuff is kind of ping-ponging all around the place, this was just a fun, good old-fashioned match. Rhodes also cut his promo beforehand, and he was all pumped up when Claudio went, oh, I'm going to shatter your dreams. And I was such a nerd, I was like, ha, 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 this is a gold dust reference. Dustin also had Arn and Brock Anderson in his corner, which was interesting, and William Regal and Wheeler Yuta were out there supporting Claudio, even though Regal was on commentary. And these two guys just went at it instantly. Like, Dustin Rhodes went for a sunset flip, and then Claudio reversed that into the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment. And you you could just see them working together like magic. Claudio then caught Rhodes after a cross body and that guy is so strong when they started to punch each other in the face. And that's when they were reversing everything because Castagnoli went for a backslide but somehow Dustin still hit a lariat. He also followed it up with a cannonball off the apron and I'm sorry but Dustin Rhodes is north of 50. How the flub is he getting better with age? Carried this on with a Hurricane Rana and a Code Red. And that's what I did with my hand. I just face palmed and I try and pull it off my head, but I'm sweating so much with shock, I'm not able to do it. Hop. There we go. We of course got the big swing eventually because people would have rioted afterwards and Claudio kind of came out of that right into the cross face. But Dustin was having none of that and he too reversed it into the most devastating move of all of sports entertainment. He then got back to his feet, he gave him the big power slam and one of the weirdest pub drivers you'll ever see, but hey ho, things go bad, and he got a two. We then went into quite an interesting finish and one that Dustin Rhodes had done years ago in WCW because Claudio whipped Dustin off into the ropes. He went to give him a leapfrog, but he didn't jump high enough, meaning Rhodes went right into Claudio's penis. I am not going to mince my words here. Now, Arn Anderson is a sick freak because he was all like, get him, Dustin, get him. But Rhodes is like, no. I am a scholar and a good person. I shall not capitalize on this. And I imagine if you were watching it live, you had a bit more time, but we clearly cut it down in the edit because from nowhere, Cloudy went up, oh, testicles are fine, hit him with the uppercut, and he got the one, two, three. But I tell you, this was kind of creative and you never see anything like this. And given how much wrestling I watch, I think you should do more of it. I'm giving it an up. It was just a fun match. So once again, we do get to the end of another AEW Rampage and could it have more star power on it? Sure. But do not forget, we still did progress a bunch of angles here, especially with CM Punk, especially with Hook, and of course, everything between Powerhouse Will Hobbs and Ricky Stark. Also, you push play and it's done so damn fast. I mean, what the hell do you want from them? Up. Now, please do leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about last night's AEW Rampage. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. And remember the three rules of the Triforce. One, go to whatculture.com. Two, follow us on social media. Three, watch more videos. And only then do you do option four, save Princess Zelda. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you for watching me as always. Goodbye.